Um, when you came in, I have put everybody on mute. I would ask you to stay on mute unless you are speaking. If you wish to speak, please put your hand up. You can raise your hand uh, using the um, there's a menu at the top and with a with a hand symbol. It's fairly straightforward. If you have any problems, you can also put it in the chat. Um, the chat is active, so if anybody wants to write anything, feel free to write anything at any time. We will try and monitor that as well. If I do invite you to chat, then please say who you are and say what country you represent and if you're an athlete or a coach. Um, yes, thank you very much for joining us. So let's move on. Firstly, <coughs> this is the agenda for the evening. So we're going to have a couple of welcomes. A couple of people are going to say a few things. Then we're going to go on to some reflections from this year's events. Then we're going to look at the events going forward. Then uh, the gender equality issue, which is probably going to be the biggest uh, section of the meeting this evening, and then we'll move on to any other business and we'll see how much time we've got left. I hope to have this uh, this meeting take around two hours. If uh, if we finish early, which I think is very unlikely, that's fine. If we decide that we're having a great time and we want to continue, then we can ca carry on as well. So I've already kind of given a quick introduction and uh, given you some of the rules about this evening. So now I would invite uh, Leo Haldner, the IOF president, to say something. Dear friends, and welcome to IOF Auto Rentering Athletes and Coaches Open meeting. One of our goals has been to increase involvement at various levels and to listen all stakeholders in our organization. The rapid growth in the use of digital tools gives us the opportunity to listen to more and different points of view. I thank the IF Food Orientary Commission for organizing this event. I promise to listen carefully to your views and opinions, and I wish you a successful meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leho. Uh, from my perspective and everybody else's perspective, I think it's really great that you're here this evening uh, to show that the IOF Council is also really interested in what the athletes and coaches have to say. OK, uh, oh. so just a quick welcome from the Foot Orienteering Commission. So for those of you who don't know, we are a commission with 12 people and a couple of us are here this evening. We we meet approximately six or seven times a year and we deal with all of the uh, operational side of things to do with foot orienteering. Um, so the last couple of, or the last year or so, we've obviously been meeting virtually, but hopefully we'll get back to meeting in person soon. And we obviously we exchange emails on a, an almost weekly basis about a great many things. Uh, between the 12 of us, we have many different areas of responsibility. And one of my key responsibilities is I act as a liaison with the, the athletes and the coaches um, in foot orienteering. So I've only been in the commission this year. This is my first year in it. And I joined because I have a real passion to give the athletes and coaches more of a voice in how the IOF is run. So the first thing and possibly the most important thing I want to say this evening is that as an athlete and a coach, if you have got concerns or things you would like to raise, please don't hesitate to come to the Futo Commission and to me in particular uh, to, to raise anything you like. Um, right, having said that, I would like to pass over to Jan Eric. Uh, to welcome the Athletes Advisory Group. So I believe he wants to share his screen now, so I will stop sharing. Perfect. Um, I'm not quite sure how to share. There we go, share. And yeah, I can see that, that's good. Right. And you guys can see the presentation version of it, eh? Uh, yes, that's great. Thank you. Okay, super. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm my name's Jan Eric, and this past April, uh, the first athletes advisory group was put together, and currently consists of five members: uh, Florian from Switzerland, Teresa from the Czech Republic, Gustav from Sweden, Natalia from Russia, and I am Jan Eric Ness uh, from Canada. And so our main goal is to act as a voice for the athletes and for orienteers in general, so that we can offer a diverse set of opinions when advising the IOF on different decisions. The structure of the AAG is that there are, currently we have a three-year term that's going on, and that's to establish 
the extra year is to establish a base for how we can best function uh, now and in the future. And in the future, it's continuing two year terms. And we're composed of four to six members with a minimum of two females and two males and one non-European representative. I'm your non-European representative. Um, and elections occur every two years. This past, I think it was June or so, we had our first election and it was pretty great to see that 51% of the eligible athletes voted. And in order to be an eligible athlete, you had to have competed at a World Cup or a walk within the last two years. So we represent athletes uh, and orienteers on a couple of different bodies. The first so is that we represent photo athletes simply on the athletes advisory group. Um, and there are three other disciplines that also have athlete advisory groups, mountain bike, coast, EO, and Trello. And together, the four of us form a, oh, I missed a couple, uh, form the Athletes Commission. And from there, we have uh, Gustav and Teresa that are representing the FUDO Athletes Advisory Group. And from there, Teresa sits on the IOF Council, where we have, starting next year, we'll have uh, a vote on all of their decisions that are being made. And the AAG also corresponds directly with them on, uh, on different decisions. So for a couple of the projects that we are working on that are ongoing or um, are part of our general requirements. Firstly, we are here to advise the IOF and the photo commission on whatever decisions that they're struggling to make or where they want to have more athlete engagement and to make sure that a diverse uh, panel of opinions and is able to be uh, talked about. And what we're working on right now for that extra year of uh, having this term is to better define the AAG structure, uh, the different positions within it, and set the expectations for members as well as engagement with our community. And uh, the other main project that we're starting to work on is to establish a bit of an athletes forum. And so some of you may have already been reached out to, whether it be um, over social media so that we were contemplating whether it be a, uh, a Facebook group or an emailing list to better engage with all of the athletes that we represent. And that brings us to the final and most important part of the AG is that we, we want to engage with you. Uh, if you're interested in engaging, we'd ask that you keep up to date on your local and international orienteering discussion uh, to keep informed and also to keep a lookout for the Athletes Forum. And if you are really interested in this, let us know what works for you and we'd gladly have you on board with that project. Uh, please say hi to us in races and things. You might not see me as crazy much because I am over uh, on the other side of the ocean, but as for all of the others, they tend to be around Europe quite a bit more often. So say hi and we'd love to engage with you guys. Uh, it's, and so, but if you're not able to see us in person, uh, consider sending a message over Facebook Messenger or Instagram for uh, myself, Teresa and Natalia, and then all three of us are available, or sorry, all five of us are available uh, via email, and you can find those on the IOF AAG webpage. Uh, lastly, I'd just like you to say thank you for all the participation we've had so far uh, within the AAG. It's been really great to have 51% uh, turnout for, um, for athletes. It shows that this is something that the elite side of orienteering is really interested in having representation for. And I'd like to remind you all that we are representing your needs. And in order for us to succeed, we need to hear from you. So please engage with us and use us as your voice. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jan Eric. That was very good. Uh, I'd like to just uh, totally agree with all of that. And um, I will just unspotlight 
Jan Eric and spotlight myself again. Yeah, highlight all of that. And if you if the athletes don't talk to the athlete advisory group and then they can't pass it on to the Photo Commission, we can't pass it on to the IOF Council. So it's a, a really important part of the process. OK, I will start my screen share again. So the next slide I'm going to ask Blair Truin to present as he this is uh, slightly out of order, but as Blair is only available for the first part of the meeting, he's going to present a little bit about the World Cup for next year. So Blair, over to you. OK, thanks. Uh, thanks, Graham. And uh, uh, just to introduce myself, I'm uh, also a member of the uh, Foot Orient Turing Commission and uh, one of my responsibilities on the commission is for World Cup. Uh, so we're, we're currently in the process of uh, uh, defining the special rules for the 2022 World Cup, and uh, uh, most most of these are, fair, are pretty similar from year to year, such as the, the scoring system and the uh, number of runners. But there are a few that we look at uh, uh, each year. Uh, and the first, the, uh, there are just a couple of areas which I thought were particularly worth bringing attention to and uh, uh, getting feedback on if uh, uh, if people have feedback. Uh, the first is for start interval for long distance, and uh, uh, I think it's fairly clear from the, you know, the feedback and correspondence we've had uh, so far uh, that the preference of athletes uh, in the long distance is to have a start interval of, of, uh, of three minutes or uh, perhaps even longer where it is practical. Um, the problem we have for World Cups is that uh, uh, most World Cup races are run as a straight final uh, and the World Cup team sizes are much larger than they are at WOC, so we have much larger fields. Uh, in recent years, typically our men's fields for World Cup races in Europe have been about 120 and uh, for women about uh, 100. Uh, and we think that uh, for with the European Championships this year, they could even be a little bit bigger than that. Now, uh, uh, that means if you have a three minute interval for everybody, uh, 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 you have a start window that ends up being uh, uh, more than six hours long, uh, which means a very long quarantine. And for the final World Cup round, which is in October, uh, you potentially start to run into problems with the uh, number of hours of daylight as well. Uh, uh, so the, uh, what was done this year and uh, what we propose to do uh, uh, next year uh, is a hybrid where we uh, uh, have uh, a three minute uh, start interval for the, uh, for the later runners and a two minute interval for others. And uh, uh, yeah, we'd be interested in feedback on whether people uh, see that as fair. Uh, in our current draft, for uh, the wording we have is that uh, the three minutes interval applies at a minimum for the last 30, and uh, a senior event advisor can uh, authorise extending that to more runners. Uh, the idea there being that uh, once we know how many runners are entered, uh, if the field is not quite as big as uh, the maximum, then uh, uh, we can extend the three minute start interval to more runners. The other uh, start interval uh, area, which uh, isn't on this slide, but I'll mention is that uh, for the individual sprint round, uh, we are proposing to do the same as has been done uh, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, which is for one of the races uh, to have a break between the top 40 and the rest in the start sequence. Uh, and the idea of that is uh, uh, so that TV can cover uh, the top 40 of the women and then the top 40 of the men uh, separately or maybe the other way around. Uh, and the idea there is, uh, yeah, is that uh, TV, uh, first sprint there is uh, so much action that TV cannot really cover both of the races simultaneously. Um, the other thing I'll note here is that uh, uh, EOC format. Uh, I, th I think it's perhaps not quite you know, widely appreciated that EOC in general is going to follow the World Cup rules uh, on things like team size, which means the EOC fields will be larger than they have been previously. Uh, but EOC also has a qualification uh, race for middle distance. Uh, now, most of you will know that at WOC, the format for qualification is for top 15 and then uh, one competitor for each uh, 
uh, country not otherwise represented in the final. Uh, this was felt to be uh, overcomplicated, but on the other hand, it was felt that uh, uh, if it was top 15 alone, we may have a, a fairly small number of countries represented in the final with uh, when the, uh, the best uh, team, best teams have eight uh, runners plus possible personal places. So what we're proposing is that uh, uh, the EOC middle distance qualification be the first 20 from each of three heats, but uh, then with no additional places uh, uh, for countries not represented. So uh, again, any comments on that would be welcome. Uh, there is, it is also planned to run a B final at, at, for the EOC middle distance, and uh, that wouldn't carry any World Cup points, but it would be a, a standalone world ranking event, so people could still get world ranking points there. So that's uh, it for me. Any fee immediate feedback or questions? Yeah, thank you, Blair. I think if anybody wants to say anything right now, feel free to put your hand up. But otherwise, feel free to contact us at the Photo Commission. You can get my email address or Blair's email address from the uh, IOF website fairly easily yeah. and just send us any thoughts yeah. on this. Yeah, and as uh, Graham said, unfortunately, I'm uh, not able to stay in the meeting. I actually have a meeting clash at 5.30 a.m., would you believe? Uh, so uh, any anything that comes up in discussion later, I'm sure uh, Graham will uh, uh, take note of and we can discuss within the Commission. OK, so we've got the first person. This is Ernst, so I'll unmute you, Ernst. Uh, how do I do that? Actually, I think you have to do it yourself. Would you like to join us? <clears throat> Hello, my name is Ernst. I'm coach. I've been from Austria and I've been coaching male and female runners <clears throat> that made it to the World Cup and to the World Championships. Uh, my question is to the three minutes. The three minutes interval, I, I guess, is to curb on following. Um, this might be even not enough. So why has the idea on file loop been Dismissed. Uh, uh, if, if, yeah, okay. The the idea on fire loop hasn't uh, no, definitely hasn't been dismissed, and uh, you know I think it is still very much an active area of discussion. Uh, you know, within the commission and within the IOF more generally as to you know what can be done to minimise the, the risks of following, and certainly we. Yeah, you know, strongly encourage uh, course planners and senior event advisors to, uh, you know, to think about plan how they plan their courses. And, uh, uh, you know, in, in those cases, if there are, you know, if there are suitable opportunities for things like fire loops uh, uh, and butterfly loops that uh, uh, can help break the, uh, you know, the field up, then that's certainly strongly encouraged. But, uh, yeah, I think in general discussion, we would be very interested in uh, the views of athletes as to, uh, uh, you yeah, what can be done to uh, reduce packs and reduce following. Uh, you yeah, know, we know there's been a lot of discussion uh, and I've seen some uh, uh, some some ideas on uh, various internet uh, chat forums, some of which are practical and uh, some of which are not practical. Uh, but uh, yeah, very, very interesting athlete views on that. And one more uh, final comment. I had the idea that um, WOC in the Czech Republic would have lent itself um, to file loops and uh, in Idrefell Fjell in um, World Cup in Sweden, long distance after the long, long 200 meters uphill, that would, that would have been a very nice de um, terrain for file loops or, or butterfly loops. So why, why, why was this not in, in, enforced? I think you would have to ask the uh, senior event advisors for those competitions. Uh, yeah, there is. Uh, yeah, there is no blanket IOF you know, rule or guideline which says uh, you should have fire loops. Uh, it is always uh, a matter for the course planners and the senior event advisors. Uh, you know, according to the circumstances of a uh, particular race and. Uh, yeah, you know, in a particular terrain. In you know, in some terrains it works well. In other terrains, it's a uh, uh, it's a bit of a waste of time. And uh, yeah, you know, planners always have to take a, account of what is useful where they are working. 
Yeah, thank you, Ernst. I think I would add that there's evidence that file loops actually have the negative effect in some terrain types. And actually, the best planning is to have a good root choice, long legs, which split the runners up in a different way. Yeah, so thank you very much, Ernst. I see that, uh, Yari, you want to say something? Yep, thanks, Graham. Um, uh, one one other thing is is um, not not only consider this um, uh, fellow orienteers helping each other with a good result. We have seen uh, many examples of that. But if if this um, uh, three minute interval will lead up to six hours of starting, then the weather conditions in some uh, areas can be extremely different. So so it may mean up to ten degrees difference from the early or the late starters that is against the fairness which is supposed to be the ultimate um, goal in our organized events and of course not to mention the rain and, and the shower that can also be so different from the early to the latest starters. Trevor mentioned really the, the quarantines etc but that people know up front that that is not coming as a surprise but but yes the weather is one thing to consider. Saying that, I don't know, uh, I don't remember the calendar for 2022, so that may not be an issue, but um, at least a topic to keep in mind before deciding one way or the other. Yeah, uh, yes, if they're complete, yes, I only mentioned the length of quarantine, but obviously changing conditions, uh, uh, you know, are another factor when you have a very long start window and, uh, you know, rain is always a possibility and, uh, uh, you know, if you, for particularly for competitions in summer, uh, you, uh, you know, it is possible that it will be relatively cool for the early runners and hot for the later runners. Uh, uh, you know, we don't, you know, don't have any races in really hot climates next year, but, uh, you know, Estonia in August, uh, you, know, you, you know, you you can still possibly get days near 30. So it's, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, it's obviously a consideration. OK, thank you very much, Yari. Uh, I don't see any other hands up at the moment, so let's leave it there for now. Thank you very much, Blair, for presenting that. Uh, enjoy your next meeting. Um, OK, so I'm going to move on to the next slide if there's no more comments. So I'm going to ask uh, Brigitte Gruninger Huber to present this one. She is uh, from the World Cup Consortium and so is best placed to ask about reflections on 2021. Yes, hello to everybody. Uh, Graham, thank you. Uh, he already introduced myself a little bit. Uh, I'm part of the Verein Swisscap, which is together with the IOF building the uh, World Cup Consortium. We had the goal to bring up the, or we still have, to bring the World Cup uh, to a new level for you, for the athletes, for the teams. And um, we wanted to start last year 2020 which was yeah postponed to this year so we are now at the end of the first season of the so-called new world cup and we are really uh, happy if we get some comments from athletes and coaches if you even felt some difference or if it just was as good as always <laughs> and of course we want to know what we can do better in future um, one particular question or three the three questions we have um, was about the start interval changes we had we had this in the long distance in italy uh, in the sprint distance in switzerland um, that we changed the starting the roll from two to three minutes in the long and from 60 to 90 uh, seconds in the sprint. And we also had this break for uh, for an hour, I think, between some of the starters in the same class. So is there anybody who, who would like to comment, like from, from your runner's view, was it like unfair? Was it like good to have it? Um, is there anybody who dares to comment? <laughs> well, I'll start then. I think it was really good to um, 
at least have the the the, the best runners, if you like, with the bigger start interval. That's much better than having everybody with a shorter start interval, if it's not possible because of the things we've already discussed with Blair. Well, if nobody's commenting on that, uh, of course, you can still send us the comments like as Graham did, said before. And um, yeah, we will for the moment in the special rules draft, it's uh, going to be the same way for next season. Then uh, we would like to know if there were any format issues, like do you think the the mixture of forest and sprint races, um, was it in a good way also for next year? Is that the way we should go on? Like the goal is to, that you can prepare for a sprint walk after like the forest walk. So in, in the autumn, you would have like sprint races and then in spring as well maybe mixed with one forest race or vice versa for the for the next walk of course sometimes the terrain is different is maybe not good for only sprint only forest whatever so yeah that's what we are planning at the moment is there any comment on on this Well, again, while anybody else is getting their courage together, I will say my feeling, which is I find it uh, a little bit strange. I, I say this because I do forest orienteering and I don't do sprint orienteering anymore, unfortunately, but I don't like it when there's uh, like two forest races and one sprint or, or the other way around, because there's a lot of people who only do sprint or only do forest. And so it makes it less valuable to go to those rounds. But I, I'm aware that that's my personal opinion and many other orienteers like to do everything. But I do also think that it's really nice how it's you have like the year to prepare. OK, Thierry, would you like to join us and say something? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, from, would you please, uh, first of all, would you please introduce yourself and who you represent? Thank you, Graham. <laughs> so I'm um, the head coach of the Finnish team. And uh, what I would like to say, of course, uh, it's a lot of teams who are the runners who focus both on forest and sprint, but it's also more and more teams who have a very specialist. And uh, I would say it's best to have runes with like uh, pure uh, distances, so either forest or sprint. It will make the economy of the team a bit easier and also to be able to travel with uh, specialist runners. So I, I see it as a good thing. If like, uh, for example, in Italy, uh, two, some weeks ago, it would have been uh, just forest and not uh, sprint relay. Thank you very much, Thierry. Does anybody have any different opinion to that? Does anybody think it's, it's good to have the mixture? No, I think we all agreed. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> OK, then the uh, last question was about winning times. We had this season, we often had longer winning times than uh, expected. Uh, then I is like written in the rules. Um, is there any comment about the gender question? We will come later, but um, like is there any comment also for the sprint races? We we had sprint races that were too long. Um, we always try to <laughs> to be in the in the timeline, but uh, so my question for you, Brigitte, is what, um, why is it planned when the target for a sprint is twelve to fifteen minutes? Is the winning time in the bulletin fifteen minutes? Because if it's if you say that it's like 50% chance it will be above or below, then you you have a 50% chance that you will fail to be in the window. Why isn't the target 13 minutes or 14 minutes? That's always the target. <laughs> yeah, so the IOF rules well, say it should be 12 to 15, but we regularly yeah. have sprints which are one in 16 minutes, which is not what's in the rules. It is, it is. Yeah, that's really something that we have to 
to take up with the senior event advisors. So, um, yeah. And uh, also, like in the World Cups in Sweden, for example, the winning times were 80, oh, the, the target times were 80 for women and 100 for men. And actually, they were long courses, especially in the women. Whereas if the target was halfway in the window, then it's much less likely that the courses will be outside of the window. Yeah, yeah. It's always that the course setters, they have so good at ideas and <laughs> it's always easier to have a longer course than to have a shorter one. But uh, yeah, so what's the really... solution? Is it is it for the event advisors to do a better job? I mean, it's for the course setters, but the event advisors have to to make sure that uh, yeah, they really stick to the like you said to the seventy five and not to the eighty, and then it's maybe bad weather or too hot, and then it's getting yeah. five more. So I did a short analysis from this year's results for uh, for the Advent Advisor seminar in two weeks. And I saw from, I think it was 34 races that 18 of them had winning times that were outside of the, mm. uh, the estimated, like the target times. And so that's more than half, which is, there's clearly something not right there. Okay, but then uh, I think about past World Cup season, yeah, again, if you have comments, let us know and uh, we will try to to get better. Would anybody like to make any comments now um, about anything from the uh, the races from last uh, this last year? OK, that's good. I guess everybody's here to talk about the gender equality in a few minutes. So uh, let's move on to the next slide, which is the 2022 uh, and onwards program. Uh, Brigitte, would you like to say anything about this or um, sh should I just go through it and show everybody what the plans are? Uh, yeah, I think you can go through. OK, I'll just go through it very quickly. Um, so I'm not the expert on all this. This is the information as I understand it at the moment. So the, the programme for next year is that there is a World Cup in May, which is a sprint only round. And then obviously in June, there's the World Championships, which is a sprint uh, sprint World Championships in Denmark. Then in August, it's the European Championships, which is also a World Cup, which is forest only disciplines. And then we have the Forest World Cup in Switzerland, which is doubling as the, the, the test races for off pre-World Championships races for Switzerland next year. Then in 2023, the plan is that the World Cup will be a forest round in Norway in April before the World Champs in Switzerland. Uh, I mean, you can read all this just as well as I can read it out. But um, the thing that I notice is that there is a plan to have a mixed round in, in Czech, which obviously is something we've just discussed. And then um, European Champs after that. Uh, and then 2024, uh, this is all, uh, none of this is confirmed yet, as far as I know, except for the World Championships. I think these are all strong plans, but nothing is finalised. Uh, maybe Birgitta knows more than I do about that. Um, so my understanding is that in May and June, there will be uh, one weekend in Switzerland and then a gap in the middle and then one weekend in Italy, perhaps with some training camp in the middle. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, maybe not. A, it's more like one or two day to... Okay transfer but it's only like yeah. four hour drive maybe by car so maybe even less yeah maybe if you can go back to 22 just yeah. to let you know that uh, I think it's maybe the first time at least for the last 10 or 20 years that the final race will be a long distance next season the individual of the individual great would anybody like to ask any questions or make any comments about the programme for the next three years? There was one uh, so there's a, in the chat. Yeah, about April in Norway, will there be snow? <laughs> uh, I think it's in late April, at least, if I remember correctly. <laughs> yeah, OK, would you like to make any comments on that? Um, I, I don't know whereabouts in Norway it is. I assume it's not going to be Oh, thank you, Liv. No snow. Yeah, I can comment. Uh, it's uh, in Østfold uh, again, yep. no, not far away from where the World Championship was in uh, two years ago. And okay. uh, there is certainly no snow there in the end of April. There's nearly no snow during the winter. Brilliant. Thank you very much.
OK, any more questions? Would anybody like to ask anything or make any more comments? I, I think it looks like a good program from what I can see. Thank you to the World Cup Consortium. OK, if nobody else has anything else to comment, then we will move on to the next slide, which is possibly the big topic for the evening, which is the gender equality and uh, so equal winning times for the long distance to start with and then uh, onto the mixed sprint relay leg order. So I think the there's a like this the generic point of as a sport, do we think that we should have uh, gender equality? And then there's the question of what does that actually look like? And so I think it's fair to say that foot orienteering is lagging behind a bit in this compared with the other orienteering disciplines. Uh, it, it's only the long distance, I believe, in foot orienteering that has this this difference. And I think if you look at a lot of other sports, there's all kinds of different approaches. So some sports have absolute equal winning time. Some people, some sports have equal distances uh, competed over, but obviously none of them are orienteering. Uh, we are a very unique sport and we have a lot of tradition over many years. And it's also worth considering, um, I don't consider myself to be an expert on this by any means, but it's also worth considering that anything that is decided at a World Championships, uh, World Cup level, also has massive implications for uh, for athletes preparing from that all the way down to the age of potentially 14 or 15, which is when you start to get that split in, or certainly in Britain, that's when the, the, the boys start doing longer distances than the girls do. And, and similarly, if um, if the elites are running uh, different, if we're going to change the elite winning times, then that probably also has a knock on impact on the masters level. So world masters competitions um, for all world ranking events and probably also for uh, national level as well. And we know that there's already been a big discussion in Scandinavia. Uh, so Sweden, I know, already has equal winning times. I believe Norway it has some consultation on at the moment. But beyond that, I'm afraid I'm not, I don't know a lot about what other countries are doing. So this is a really good opportunity for everybody to to share what their country is doing uh, and to give us your thoughts on it. So so please do. So who would like to start us off? Leif, please. Yeah, I can just say <clears throat> on behalf of the Norwegian Federation that uh, we are actually starting that debate uh, now. Uh, and we have the aim of making a decision uh, uh, in one year time. So we will uh, we will use the, the coming year uh, both to learn from Sweden and the experiences in, in Sweden and uh, and also have a broad discussion now in Norway on the topic. And it's it's not an easy topic. It's uh, uh, it has a lot of consequences, as you also said, and, uh, and uh, it really needs a broad discussion. And I think everybody uh, needs to understand why the decision will be as it is, as it will be in the end. So how are Norway going to make this decision apart from looking at what happens <coughs> in Sweden? We actually will kick it off tomorrow. Um, we have some kind of uh, assembly meeting for all the region leaders uh, tomorrow. Um, uh, and there we will propose a process uh, where we uh, propose to define a working group with uh, athlete representatives, both uh, men and women and juniors and seniors. Uh, also some other stakeholders like uh, uh, national team coaches, uh, um, club trainers, uh, so on. So we'll have a working group of uh, maybe seven, eight persons. Um, the aim there is that the working group should define the important topics which needs to be discussed for, uh, for before we take this uh, decision. Uh, and then after Christmas, we plan to uh, to uh, get the broad discussion within the Norwegian regions, clubs, uh, so on, and and uh, and uh, try then to again gather towards the summer to gather the results from those discussions and the input, and then uh, then during the autumn again. Uh, put together this working group uh, and try to make some 
recommendations for uh, for uh, next year's uh, uh, assembly for the regional leaders, where where uh, uh, a decision will be made. Okay. So 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 we try to to then also use different uh, you could say uh, training camps for for juniors seniors also to to raise this discussion maybe in some evening meetings and so on and and uh, uh, so so yeah so so we we try to to run quite a broad process on uh, on this. OK, that's really interesting. Thank you. And I assume that if the IOF was to make some decisions on this, then that would have a big impact on it as well. Yes, we, we really like to be coordinated with the uh, IOF because uh, what's done internationally is uh, probably also one of the important uh, topics that uh, that we need to take uh, take into account. Yeah, that's great. So I see that a couple of people have their hands up. What I want to do first is ask from somebody from Sweden to talk about how their experience has been in the last year or so and how their process happened. Is there anybody who is willing to talk about that? <clears throat> yes, I could say some words. Uh, that would be um, great. Thank you, Nicholas. Yes, I'm representing um, um, yeah, the Swedish Federation with uh, uh, organizing questions and everything about that, maps, rules, and uh, yeah, some IT as well. Uh, anyway, we had uh, this as a um, suggestion for our um, uh, Förbundsmöte, I don't know the word, Graham. Um, yeah, federation meeting. Yeah, yeah federation like a, a, meeting. Like we your have, annual uh, AGM or yeah. something. Yeah, exactly. We have it uh, every second year and uh, there was a, a proposition for, for this and uh, there was, a, of course, a discussion about it and then the, the meeting, they, they decided this and we, this was back in, I think, 2016 or, um, yeah, and at least we ha had it now for a couple of years for the um, uh, seniors uh, and juniors, uh, like the yeah, uh, 18, 20 and 21 classes. Uh, for the youth people, they almost already had it. It was the same. Uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, the winning times were almost the same, um, except for uh, 16, the 16 classes, uh, a couple of yeah, a couple of minutes uh, between, and we changed that. So now they they also have um, uh, equal winning times. Uh, well, not yeah, what do you call it? Beräknad. <laughs> you yeah, you e count estimated. Yeah, estimated. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. So, and now that we have, um, uh, we're we are working on um, imp implementing this also uh, in the thirty five and older classes as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there is a project going on and uh, we uh, put out uh, a survey for a lot of, I don't know, Mette, my colleague here, uh, how many replies we got uh, for this, but uh, yeah, we made, um, uh, it's kind of a huge uh, project and also for the other um, disciplines as well, um, ski orienteering and mountain bike orienteering. Uh, I think I'm not sure. I think Mette knows how um, I think we had it for mountain bike orienteering. Um, uh, we already had it, but then we found out now that, uh, as we discussed earlier here, that the winning times, uh, the estimated winning times, they were too long or too short at a lot of competitions, but they were yeah. equal between the genders, but but not. Uh, so that's what one thing we found out about this. Uh, uh, yeah looking into it more so yeah that's it so but we haven't heard um, any complaints I think everyone is, is taking it a little bit for granted uh, of course it's tougher because we we didn't uh, we changed um, we had the, the uh, men estimated times as our what do you call it like uh, the norm uh, yeah. somehow it, that wasn't um, uh, I mean, it could have been the other way around, but we, that's what we decided. And of course, it's tough. Uh, it would take a couple of years uh, for training and everything uh, when there are longer courses. But we think that um, 
yeah eventually it will it will and and it's already uh, kind of the, taking it for granted and uh, you know what's coming you you need to be trained and uh, yeah it could be hard but i think it it has been good so far and no complaints yeah. so far so yeah yeah from what i've seen from the outside it, it looks good and the women i've spoken to are happy they think that's the way it should be i think that's maybe that's the culture in sweden as well uh, but that's really interesting. It, what would be really interesting even more is to see what the the older athletes, the people who are 35 to 100, if, what they think about it. Definitely, yes. Mm. Okay, thank you very much, Nicholas. Mette, you'd like to say something? Uh, this is uh, Mette Brolinsson. I work for the Swedish uh, Federation uh, and I'm the project manager for the proposal that is now out on the uh, open um, uh referral to all our members when it comes to uh having equal winning times for all the master classes as well in all four uh disciplines uh so we've had some comments from the older athletes as well but um i'm looking at that proposal right now and uh, are, are doing some changes and uh, revisions to it and we hope that we uh, will be able to present a final suggestion for that um, mid-November and that will um, then be implemented in 2022. Okay and when you say that will be implemented will you is the target to make the winning times for men and women the same for for all ages after that or is it like going to be a gradual process? Um, that is not set in stone yet but I think that um, for the disciplines that have already used to working with winning uh, equal winning times uh, it's just small revisions so that we will implement right away um, the question is what we'll do with the, um, the foot o and uh, that is something that we will have to discuss with the uh, districts and the athletes as well okay thank you very much uh, does anybody have any questions for for nicholas and meta at this point before i go on to ernst and david who've got their hand up well, why don't we go to David Zafanski? Would you like to say something? You have your hand up just now. Uh, hi, I'm not David. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm uh, David's wife, Hanna Wisniewska. I'm a uh, Polish elite runner. Uh, and the problem which I see, it's uh, the long distance on the big events. It's never like in just one event. It's in some program. And that's the the problem. That uh, I don't know any other discipline when you run effort for around 90 minutes. It's something like more than half marathon. And day after you run, for example, 10k effort like relay or middle distance. And that's the problem from like physiological point of view. I would say uh, that it's never like separate uh, separate uh, separate event as long distance. OK, and do you think that the fact that it's already like that for men, do you think that it shouldn't be like that for men or do you think that it, it should be different because men and women are different? Uh, I think that it should be different because uh, we are different men and women. Uh, I don't know what exact time should be, but the, the other problem it's, uh, for example, this year, uh, the estimated winning time didn't uh, uh, well, didn't suit the the the, ra the re reality. Let's say. Yeah, they were they were wrong. But I know that yeah. there were some they were wrong this year. But that's not necessarily what we're discussing now. But I I do take your point. Yeah, but, but maybe if uh, if the prediction time would be okay, that wouldn't be a problem. But we never know. For example, this year, what what can uh, happen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, I would say that, that, that. Sorry. Carry on. Yeah, that, that's all. I okay, so, so there is a lot of evidence and a lot of people argue that women are actually stronger when it comes to the longer distances, um, maybe not over 90 to 100 minutes, maybe we're talking hours, but um, do, why do you think that women are not so able to cope with this tough program as men? Uh, I wouldn't say that uh, uh, they, that won't be able to cope with this uh, program. I, I would like to say that at all, it's a very tough program for for everybody. That yep. maybe we will do it for 90 minutes for both men and women. 
not 100 for men, 80 for women. Maybe we should shorten a little bit when it's in a busy program, for example, like in Czech Republic to 90 minutes or 85 for both. Yeah, uh, there's there's something that could be different. So not every World Cup needs to be a 90 or a 100 minute winning time. Yeah. It could be just the championships that have that long distance with a long, long winning time. And then the World Cups could have a shorter winning time. The IOF can can make that decision if they think that it's it suits the program as well. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Uh, you. Ernst, Ernst, you had your hand up next. I think this was an uh, interesting um, addition that you just heard. Um, my question is to the IF councillor. If the decision about um, the long distance winning times for women is decided by Sweden and Norway, aren't you afraid that you will be losing quite some countries in participation in, in future? I just think of the Colombians that they didn't even make the, the time to finish. <clears throat> Yeah, it's a fair point, and I think it's important that we have these consultations where it's not just people from Sweden and Norway, uh, where everybody has their opportunity to say what they think. And I, I think that the IOF definitely won't be guided by just the, the big orienteering countries, if you like. I certainly won't be. Yeah, but aren't you afraid that you will be losing some of the uh, smaller countries or not so potent countries? It might also act as a real big motivation for some other people from some of the smaller countries. It's hard to say at this point, I think. May I just answer Ernst from uh, from Norway? <laughs> please, please yeah. do. Yes, we are afraid of that. And uh, I'm personally, I'm also afraid that we can lose a lot of especially junior girls uh, if, uh, if the conclusion will be that their courses will be much longer. Uh, also younger senior women. Uh, but but that's uh, that's uh, something we need to take into that discussion before we make the the decision on this. And uh, equal winning times doesn't necessarily mean longer winning times for women. It can also mean shorter winning time for men. Okay, yeah. that would that would be okay. Thank you, Ernst, and thank you, Leif. Uh, before I go to Natalia, who's got a hand up, I would just say that. Uh, certainly we had a conversation earlier in the year within Britain about this and I think that one of the points that the, the women made was that some young women would be put off by the fact that they're treated differently to men. So actually having it the same might attract some women more than others. Anyway, I will go to Natalia. Would you like to, to say something? Uh, hello everybody. Yeah, I would like uh, to tell uh, just to uh, a point on TV translation for long distance. Nobody, <laughs> it's so boring to look for a one, 140 uh, uh, race time. And uh, uh, we can have a look already for a result list. And uh, in women, uh, in, uh, so we lose five minutes between first and second place. Then we lose one, two minutes between short, fourth, fifth, sixth place and top 10, it's already uh, out from 90 minutes and all the rest, they are like, they make really marathon job. And it's, uh, as Hanna Vichvitnieska told, it's already fifth race or fourth race per, uh, per, um, uh, in a week, yeah? And uh, it's a physically, it's a really uh, some, uh, like, it's not acceptable uh, to make uh, yeah uh, all track and field distance uh, mi middle and long distances in one week it's like very bad for a body and uh, i'm completely not agree to make a woman race uh, same as a man race because it will be very boring nobody will look it it's very bad for tv it will be a lot much, much more boring to uh, uh, to see a GPS in a, like uh, replay mode <laughs> because like it will be five, ten, and more minutes between uh, leader and all the rest, and it's it's uh, going to be same in the main course when we have now Casper Foster who show an incredible time in a uh, uh, in a. Hydrophiel and 
uh, and in Czechia also, in Czechia especially, uh, he did a really 100 years race, <coughs> like a uh, great race, and uh, that he catch, caught some people. It's just like sh showed how it was a perfect race. And like it's make a five minute between first, like in second uh, man. <laughs> It's like uh, we have to look for uh, from TV side. What what would be interesting for TV? What would be interesting for spectators in TV to watch 140 or 120? Like uh, for a man, I mean, like I'm uh, more like that you make uh, we make it equal when we make it equal, we make it equal uh, to 100 uh, or, um, to 80 minutes it will be much more interesting. Uh, so this is my opinion. OK, thank you very much, Natalia. So you think that they should be equal, but that the men should be reduced to what the women are? Uh, it can be equal. It will be much more interesting for TV spectator, not one hour 40, you know. Okay. And yeah, yeah, you made it right, yeah. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Jan Eric, you, you had your hand up next, but you've put it down now, have you? Okay, well, you can come um, back if you was, uh, I guess I can, I can add a little bit from a perspective of, you know, you guys were talking about uh, the larger, more fit, uh, orienteering inclined nations being worried that, you know, you might lose uh, some Colombians or I can say, uh, you know, Canadians in general, we are, we can be half decent at orienteering. We're uh, not always at like the metal level, but um, uh, I'm also on the, the board of, uh, of our Orienteering Canada, and one of the big things that we consider uh, in who we're putting together in our national team is who might be able to, um, to not just finish one of these races, but finish it well enough. And the longer distances that they become, it becomes fewer and fewer people uh, that can do that, especially because um, we don't have real long distance sports over in North America. Uh, the longest common sport that you're going to do is cross country. And in Canada, we have equal uh, men and women's distances for 8K. So you're not getting anyone commonly tra training more than that. There's a very small cross country ski um, portion. So you don't get the same uh, the same depth of people to train with that are outside of orienteering versus you go to Sweden or Norway and maybe you don't even have an orienteering club there, but there will be someone to go ski with. There are people that do long distances and train more. Uh, and so I can say that the Canadian Federation would definitely be uh, more, more for a shorter winning time because it's already going to be a longer winning time for uh, whoever we send, because they're probably not going to win. I mean, maybe eventually we will. But uh, um, and then on top of that is the the more accessible that these races are, the more financially feasible it becomes for someone to choose to go over, um, because most of the funding that uh, that we have goes directly to our coaches and things. And then as an athlete, you have to send yourself over. And so by having a shorter winning time, it's going to make it so that, as Natalia said, these longer winning times, you're not going to be able to do a long distance and then two days after perform well in middle distance uh, if it's at 100 minutes. But maybe you could if it's a 70 or 80 minute one. So um, the, the shorter the distance or winning time, the more accessible it becomes in sending athletes over. OK, thank you, Jan Eric. Brett, I'll come to you in just a second. I've just got one challenge for you, Jan Eric, which is if the men's race winning time is reduced, do you think that that devalues it? Do you think that makes it less uh, valuable, important? Because there's so much history and tradition behind having this really long epic. For example, maybe it's just the World Championships once a year, which is this one, which is like the, I ran the World Championships long distance. And, it, you know, the winner was 100 minutes and I took an hour and uh, two hours and a quarter or something. And that's that's actually something that's worth preserving. Yeah, I agree. There definitely is some history in there. And, uh, you know, when I have my uh, the the American team and the Canadian team, when I'm chatting with the guys that are going to be going over there, there's definitely 
a uh, certain sense of euphoria around, um, you know, I'm going into this huge race. Um, but at the same time, any of the, uh, you can say the North Americans that go over there to do the long distance, if they're accepting that they're going to do that, they don't do the other races. Um, and I've, I've heard of several people that decided then not to go over there because they, you know, only qualify for the long distance. And it's it's not something they're able to perform well in. It's just really, really hard to train for over here because there's no one to train with. You don't have a cross country ski team to train with. Um, if you're going to join a biking team, you might be able to get some stamina in there. But it's uh, it's just very hard to prepare for. So I agree that there's a good sense of history and things in there. Um, but I can say like the for uh, Canadian cross country races, um, we've moved down from 10K to 8K uh, to equalize the distance uh, with women. And there weren't too crazy many people that are turned off by that. And it just speeds up the race, right? Not only is the race faster, but you are running faster while you're throughout it. So, Great, thank you. One last question and then I'll get off you, Jan Eric. Um, yeah. Do you think philosophically that the men and women should have the same? Uh, same winning time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you very well, much. That's, that's, yeah, that's the general, uh, I'd say, at least Canadian view, and I'd, I'd say uh, American view as well. Okay. Uh, is that deserve an equal winning time. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Brett, sorry, to, it's taken a while to get to you. Not a problem. Uh, Brett Whitehart, coach of the Australian team. Um, we, we've only had a quick little discussion about it, but in general, our feeling is... We are all for uh, equal winning times, but I think it's a very valid point that obviously maybe the winning time as a, as a men's time is, is probably too long uh, and should be maybe the B alternative, say 80 to 85 or, or somewhere around there. Um, uh, someone raised the question also about how did juniors look at this coming through? I mean, I have three kids. I live in Sweden, come through junior ranks here. And I must say with two girls, they always question why do the boys have such... Uh, differences in some races in, in terms of longer winning times than the girls when they're 16 and can't explain it. So, uh, Nicholas, you're obviously listening to this, but uh, there are differences there and it maybe it's the way that course setters are generally men and that's the way that courses have been set. Don't have the answer for that. Uh, I think one sport where you see a big difference, where they still have a difference, is, is obviously the cross-country skiing where the men basically have double the distance of the women uh, in a lot of races. and as a uh, that makes absolutely no sense to me, and I don't really understand the, the mechanics behind the, the, the cross country federation that they still have that sort of system. So, generally, our feeling is yes, gender gender equality, perhaps the winning time should be a bit shorter. One final point, uh, and this probably is also you see that the scheme why uh, maybe it should always be the case that the long distance race is the last race of a world championships. Uh, because everyone knows what it takes out of the body to, to obviously do a 90, 100, 110-minute race uh, to back up at a middle distance two days later or some other distance. So maybe how the, the, the format of the races should be a, a thought there as well. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you, Brett. I think that was really useful, and I totally agree about the, having the long-distance race last. I certainly um, have found that through my career. As that was the way I always preferred to have it. I know there's a, a big thing about having the relay last because it's like the, the team one, but I, I always preferred it to have the long-distance last. Um, okay, I see that there's uh, an interesting comment in the chat from Charlie Boucher, Boucher from France. Um, would you like to give us a quick summary for, of that, please, Charlie? Yeah, so Charlie Boishu, I'm the national coach, uh, French team. Uh, uh, to the, tonight is the French night championship, so uh, I am the only one here, but uh, I talk with uh, all athletes uh, beforehand. And uh, as I wrote, the main point for them is uh, not to change the winning time for men. They all think above history behind it, that uh, it's uh, really the essence, the root of uh, this format to be long and to see the tiredness uh, going up 
and to deal with it both physically, mentally, technically. And that uh, some 80 minutes uh, winning time will not be a pure long distance. It will be a longer distance than maybe the usual uh, middle or many courses we see. But the true spirit is uh, with uh, this longer uh, time. And we, above that, we hope that uh, it will be equalizing uh, maybe in the process taking some few years or maybe already as soon as possible in one time. Uh, we think uh, the main thing is for the youth. Uh, there is no real reason for the youth and junior that uh, it is shorter for women. But for senior level, it can maybe the process can, can take a bit, still uh, some more years. But uh, we hope that uh, the winning time for men will not be changed. And the women in the French team were, they think it will be a challenge to run it uh, even longer, but uh, they, they prefer this challenge and to know it and to prepare for it than seeing the spirit of the format being changed. That's great. Thank you very much, Charlie. It's really interesting that um, th my experience is that different women have very different opinions on this. Obviously, we heard from Natalia already, who has a very different opinion to the French women, it sounds like. Yeah. Okay. Uh, who would like to say something next? Okay, so I have um, a question, which is that uh, just because we define the World Championships long distance, it, assuming we decide that the, the winning time should be the same for everybody, that doesn't necessarily mean that the long distance always has to be the same length. It could be that in some World Cup rounds, you have a shorter long distance, and in the World Championships, for example, you have a longer world, uh, longer long distance when it's the actual championships race. And that could be a solution for not making the program too hard, and it would actually make the program a little bit easier for the men as well. Because I think the comments about how tough the program is to have so many races in a, a short space of time is just as important for men as it is for women as well. Um, how about we have somebody from a country we haven't heard from yet uh, say a little bit about how it is in their country? So, uh, for example, um, somebody from Switzerland maybe like to tell us about how it is in Switzerland with the the uh, equality discussion. Or maybe from uh, Finland or Denmark or uh, or I don't mind any country. Maybe not. Oh, okay, Yari, thank you. How is it in Finland? Uh, <laughs> dark this time of the day. Next time, <laughs> call call it up at one hour early. Hey, um, uh, one 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 idea. I'm I'm listening to um, pros and cons, equalizing the times, and I, I think this is an out of the box scenario that I started to think about. Is that okay if if we were equalizing the winning times and the long distance? And may, maybe making it a little bit shorter, say 80 minutes, both genders, but same time then uh, adding into at least the walk program a mass start with a long distance, really long distance, two hours to 10, for instance. Then it's again a long, long distance and two hours is still feasible over the TV because it's a mass start. And I, I know that IOF has been trying to find a method or competition or race format where the first man or woman over the finish line is the winner. So this is a scenario playing a little bit that we still would have the very long one and, and making the equals. Just out of the box thinking. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you just give us a brief um, summary of how it is in Finland with the uh, equality discussion at the moment as well? 
Oh, I, I haven't heard any any anything of of going formally really. So it's um, uh, I think it's it's more following what's happening elsewhere and and listening and seeing the results. I I don't hear anybody being very very active on on this particular topic. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, well I think that nobody else seems to want to say anything at the moment. You have the last chance now. Um, so I think. What I'm getting from this as a summary is that there seems to be a general consensus that the winning times probably should be the same, but uh, as to what those winning times should be, that's a bigger question. And um, maybe that's what the question should really be. Uh, so the plan is with this going forward is that the uh, foot, foot orienteering commission are going to put together a working group over the next um, three to six months uh, to, to look at this issue as well with the intention that there will be something in place to, to vote on next year and the idea is that it would then be in place in 2023 program I believe. Ah okay so we have uh, Thomas would you like to say something please? Uh, hello yeah, uh, maybe I have one uh, question. We had, uh, I'm from Slovakia and I'm an athlete. Thank you. But uh, also after the World Cup in China, uh, I think we had some questionnaires which were sent to athletes. And uh, I guess my question is why not send uh, some questionnaires also to women? For example, if they, um, what do they think about the longer long distance uh, if it were to happen and uh, maybe also to men what do they think about uh, the length of their long distance if it should be shorter or if it should stay the same so that's just uh, my yeah. opinion okay Thank you. I think that the plan is that when we have this working group um, and I, I plan to be on that working group and we will invite some athletes as well. I think the plan is we will try and get uh, feedback from as many athletes as we can and also from as many coaches and also from federations. And so that will certainly play a, be a part of it. So, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, yeah, okay. uh, Christine. Yes, um, I'm representing Swiss Orienteering. Uh, we have had some very loose discussions in, in, on different levels about this. In the coaching team, it has very much been about this, that the girls do not really need to run shorter than the boys. But the opinions go a lot out of, uh, out of um, I'm speaking German, um, go, getting um, away from each other. Uh, about what should be the length. There's a strong opinion, like uh, what Charlie said as well, that the long distance, the element of the long distance is uh, is exceptional and it should not be uh, ruined. But also, especially from the girls' side, this seems to be a very long thing to run. Uh, so I think it's not a, an easy discussion to take and it does not go, far, uh, go quickly to do it. There are also some quite provocative voices who are saying, well, the marathon is the same for everybody even if it's men or women but if we're thinking about a world championship then uh, you would have to have two different courses otherwise the issue with three minute starting times would be even longer um, so of course uh, there would have to be different co courses for men and women in my opinion so it doesn't really make sense to make the same course for all well but those are all those discussions and we're not really at a point where it's a clear thing but we would of course follow what uh, happens internationally. OK, thank you very much. That's uh, very interesting as well. Um, yeah, N Natalia has just made a comment on the chat about uh, if the long distance was 20 minutes longer, would it actually change the results? Possibly not in the top 10, but it's just much tougher for everybody outside the top 10. Uh, Charlie. Yep. Sorry, uh, I think that above the winning time, probably of the long distance, the, maybe the main issue is uh, the long distance in a larger program. If the long distance would be alone, I think the discussion will not be the same. And something we have to link to this discussion is the positioning of the long distance in a competition program. And I think then 
when the long distance is at the end, it's absolutely not the same reflection for the athletes to which format they will run or not. And I have seen that uh, for next year World Cup in Switzerland, the long distance will be at the end. And on Monday, because we all know that it's a format that is uh, less TV friendly. And I'm sure it could be a good option to make it affordable for everyone to run all three races. And also a good solution for TV uh, to get the more TV friendly format on the weekend. So I think it it would be a good test next year to, to see this. But uh, we should not ask those questions without uh, questioning the position of the long distance within each competition program. And it's absolutely not the same when, for example, for next year in Estonia championship, the long distance is in the middle of the program. Yes, I totally agree. Thank you. Uh, I would just point out that I've seen in the past, for example, Olav Lundenes, when he was targeting the long distance, he would still skip the, the relay the day before or the middle distance. So I, I certainly I don't think it solves all the problems having it in the end. I think that you still you're still tired from running the other distances. And if you're still preparing for that long distance, it's it's still a very long way and it's a tough program wherever it is in the in the week schedule. But yeah, that's great. OK, last opportunity for any comments on this. Otherwise, we'll move on to the mixed sprint relay. OK, thank you very much. Let's move on to the next slide. So uh, have we got Jaron Anderson here tonight? I know he signed up. Doesn't look like he's here, unfortunately. I was hoping he would say something about this as he was one of the people who uh, who came up with the format in the beginning. So we're all familiar with the, the sprint relay. I personally was quite skeptical about it when it first came in, but I think it's been fantastic for the sport and it's one of the most interesting things to watch, usually during uh, any televised orienteering. Uh, it's always been woman, man, man, woman. Should it always be the same? Um, do, is it unfair for, for some nations who, uh, I don't know, there's an argument which says you need to have a really strong female last leg runner. And if you're a, a nation who are uh, better in the men's, then that could be a could could mean that you have less of a chance to get a medal compared with uh, the teams who have better women. But other teams have a different view of that, of course. Uh, so there's lots of different possibilities here. It could be that we we change it um, every second year or or every year, or it could be that the organizer could decide it each competition itself. Uh, how do people feel about this? Is it is there a problem? Do we need to change anything at all? Is it even an equality issue? Is it unfair for for men? Is it unfair for women? Anybody like to start us off with this? Uh, yes. So it's. Um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten. Is it Hannah? Yes, it's me again. Yeah, hi there. <laughs> Actually, uh, we considered it recently in the team that uh, it might be a good idea to refresh the sprint relay a little bit because, uh, yeah, it. I don't know, for example, why this order was set. It was set once on the beginning, and now we we follow it. Uh, but maybe we can we can change it, like uh, for example in in the, the walk cycle. Because uh, what what's uh, what was the the point of setting this this order? I have no idea. So maybe we can we can change it. Do you think that it should be changed or do you just think that it uh, it, it can change? It, it can change. Mm, yeah, because it's uh, it's different running on the first uh, on or on the last leg. And it's actually no so big difference for men when they are in the middle. Like that's as if uh, legs are the first and the last one. And it's yeah, it's mo mostly up to the girls. I would say. 
So maybe when we want to equality, <laughs> as we discussed uh, before, maybe it, it should be the same in the sp uh, sprint relay to, to do some changes. Okay, and what would you change? <laughs> I have no idea, but uh, I uh, of course the the order of, of the running, but I don't know. Maybe men, women, women, men in the, this uh, switch uh, switch the the order in every si uh, walk cycle. Okay, so it, it can change every year or every two years, maybe. Let's say, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brigitte, would you like to take the point up? Uh, yes, um, and actually uh, I'm not fully sure if that was the reason, but one of the reasons at least is that if you have women starting as an organizer, it's easier in like, let's say, old city town area to like uh, have controls set out because it's the fact that the women's field is spread out faster than the man's field. Having like in Italy now, we had like 53 teams starting in one row. And uh, yeah, you all know we have a maximum of four different controls. So it's quite a big group heading out. And uh, of course, we have with the uh, sport didn't air or with the emit uh, we have nowadays not the problem of punching at the control but still running around the corners can be really dangerous and uh, so that was at least one of the thoughts uh, to consider if you are in a park terrain it's different because there you, you don't have this like security reasons okay while you're speaking, Brigitte, what is your experience of how many teams is too many teams in a sprint relay? I think it really depends on the terrain. But uh, if we follow walk sprint relays, I think that's still good to handle. So about 30, was it maybe 35 max? And then, uh, like, I would say the having uh, all the teams with four, te all the big nations with four teams and even mixed teams so that you come over the 50, it's maybe too much. Yeah, I, I, so I guess this is a slightly different question and argument, but it could be quite relevant if we're talking about the safety element. Is yeah. there an argument that there should only be one team from each country in maybe like the A race and then there could be a B race for, for other teams? And so you, you reduce the number of teams that way. And so it's uh, less of a problem to, as to whether it's men or women starting. Do you have a thought on that, Birgitta? Uh No. <laughs> OK. I leave it for others. OK. Uh, Eric Ardenstead, I see your, your point. Would you like to say something about that? I think it's an important point to make. No, just out of out of uh, remembering how it was in the beginning, uh, as far as I remember, the first mixed relays were actually with men starting. And it was decided to put the women first because it was said that this would be more interesting also to showcase the women, uh, also to have give them more TV time. Uh, I think that the way it is now with women first, women last really gives them more significance in the race. And that is something that was actually, at the time it was implemented, was something that was wished for. Yeah, that's really interesting. I can't quite remember how it was in the first ones. Um, but yeah, it, it certainly has done that, I think. As we've said before, it, it does feel a little bit like it's, uh, the women have the prestigious legs, the first and the last leg in the, the sprint relay. Is that a gender issue as well? Is it unfair for the men to never have these important legs in the mixed sprint relay? Is there anybody who feels really strongly that uh, it should change, that men deserve a chance to, to run these more important legs? Brett. 
I can't say if it was strongly one way or the other, but if you look at how a lot of junior competitions, for example, in Sweden with with Tia Miele for the for the youth and that, they always vary. So one year the girls start, was finished, the next year the, it's the other way around. Uh, and that would be, well, I think, just as suitable. But it's nothing we've discussed in Australia in regards to that. And it's just, does it always need to be the same? I personally don't think so, no. Okay, yeah, similar uh, 25 mano, which is the, the big club competition as yep. well. That that alternates with the first and last leg as well. Yep. Anybody got any other experience from um, sprint relays in their country? Certainly in Britain, we we just follow the IOF format, but I think we would change it if, uh, if it necessary. Helga says, yes, in world championships, we've already always had women, men, men, women. Uh, Christine says it would be a shame to have fewer sprint relays at the World Cup. I don't think there's any question of having fewer. We're talking about just um, changing the order. And if um, if there were too many teams, then there could be a, a, like an A final and a B final for the, for the other teams. But that's not really the question we're asking today. OK, does anybody have any more strong feelings on this either way? Again, this will be a, a discussion that the, the gender equality working group with the Foot Orienteering Commission will take up. And if there's anybody who is interested in being on that uh, working group uh, or, or at least um, having some input into it, then please do send uh, me a message. Sara Hagstrom. OK, this is interesting. Would you like to present your idea, Sara? Uh, yes, um, it's actually a, an idea from both me and Oscar here, um, which is like inviting more uh, smaller countries to uh, be in the competition uh, by having just two people in the team. Like in biathlon, for example, they have uh, one man and one woman. Um, so I just wonder if that is being discussed somehow. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, certainly, uh, it would open it up to a, a lot more teams and there, there's certainly other sports that do that as well. Um, actually when the British, uh, sprint relay championship started a few years ago, it, for the first couple of years, it was decided that we wouldn't get enough teams if we did it with four per team. And so we did actually have that format and it worked very well. And it's actually changed now to be the, the international format, but I think it was uh, a really nice way to do it. There, there's some challenges with that regarding the forking because um, it probably means you just end up having two courses um, because the men obviously can't be fought against themselves and the women can't be fought against themselves. So there's some issues around that, but otherwise it's worth looking at, I think. Uh, Jan Eric. Yeah, I really like the idea that Sarah had. Um, I haven't put any like very much deep thought into that, but I know that a huge uh, barrier for uh, the Canadian team, at least in some of the smaller countries, is we struggle to field uh, either a second strong man or a second strong woman and bringing that down we tend to be able to have at least one one good girl and one good guy uh, that that are able to race so I think that could um, that could be really beneficial um, and then for the forking and things uh, I think you could do a similar uh, map map selection forking based on how the uh, knockout sprint works because that's now a format that's been accepted and how you need to uh, pick your Pick your forking. OK, thank you, Jan Eric. Brett? Uh, thanks, Sora. Uh, I think for if I'm calling Australia a smaller country or maybe New Zealand in this case, it, it's not an issue in a world champs that we can field a team of four, but it is an issue in World Cups. Uh, that's where it becomes a problem that we often can't or don't have four people on the ground. But for world champs isn't an issue, so it's maybe a World Cup thing in that case. Yeah, thank you, Brett. Uh, right, so there's lots more comments, so I'm just scanning through the comments. 
uh, something more about the long distance. We won't come back to that just now, but thank you for the comment. Uh, Skio, so Eric, that's what they do in Skio, is it? Yes, exactly. They have one man, one woman, and each runs three times, actually. Okay, and how is it with the, the forking? How does that work? Well, basically, it's a, it's a one-man relay for each of them. So they have, okay. like, say, courses A, B, C, and each of them runs these in a different order. Yeah, okay. And, and, so, and you switch them up. You switch yeah. them up, yeah. Mm -hmm. And are, are they kind of forked together, or are they totally different courses? Uh, depends on the area. Yeah. Yeah. And Natalia says that mountain bike orienteering also has this format as well. Uh, Brigitte, you say this destroys the team feeling. I feel like we're getting a little bit off the, the topic here at the moment. Um, let's let's bring it back to the current format and if we want to change it for now. And then uh, the photo commission, we can have a discussion about uh, this one man, one woman thing, because I think that's a much bigger discussion about changing the whole format of the sprint relay at this time. So if we take it back to the current format, does anybody have any more comments on that? And I have noted that for now. Uh, yes, so Leif. Yeah, just to say that uh, regarding the equality uh, gender issue, if we decide on having uh, equal winning times in in uh, long distance and so on, then I think the, the next question will, will then pop up uh, about the sprint relay, that uh, if it's fixed like uh, women, men, men, women, uh, then we have to solve that just in two years time or something. So, so uh, uh, I think uh, regarding equality, uh, there should also be a, a changed order from from work up to work up or from year to year uh, on that one. Uh, maybe best to have like uh, men, women, men, women, or uh, or the opposite, uh, and and change that from competition to competition. So that was my comment. OK, thank you. OK, does anybody have any more comments on this? Otherwise, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeppe. I think that's uh, yeah, that's kind of what we're we're looking at or some variation on that. Uh, OK, thank you for that. That's really interesting. So the last item on the agenda is any other business. And I have to say I've had maybe 30 or 40 people messaging me or sending some comments about this. So there are a, a huge number of items which there's no way we're going to cover a lot of them in the next 20 minutes. But I just want you, to, first of all, to know that every message you've sent, every comment you've made, I've made a note of it. And um, even if we don't discuss it, tonight, then we will discuss it uh, between the photo commission. And if it's something that you feel strongly about, then please do send us more messages. So I'll just go through them very quickly. And if there are things that people would like to talk about, then of course we can spend a few minutes on that as well. I see there's some more comments coming in about the, um, the sprint relay. That's great. Thank you. We'll look at those as well. So uh, the first thing is something that I have been talking about with the Fuso Commission already, which is that uh, we're the only discipline that doesn't have some kind of feedback mechanism from major competitions. So in ski orienteering and uh, mountain bike orienteering, at least, I'm not sure about trail orienteering, actually, I, I, I admit. But after every major competition, they send out a survey to the participants and to the coaches about the quality of the competitions, the maps, the terrain, all this kind of thing. And so it not only gives the organizers and the IOF uh, a real sense of how the athletes felt about the competition, it also gives um, uh, a way to see yeah, what the IOF can be doing better, what the event organizers can be doing better. And so it's not decided yet, but if it, if we can get some agreements on that next year, then that, oh, thank you, Jenny. We, so they do, uh, Jenny from the IOF office tells me that they do also do it in trail orienteering as well. So I'm really strongly in favour of doing that, and I hope to work with the um, the, the Photo Commission to, to get that developed in time for the comp first competition in May next year. So if, if people have comments or thoughts about that, please send them to me. 
Um, so everything else is things that other people are sent in and some of them I feel strongly about as well and others um, I, I don't mind so much. So mapping standards is always a big topic in orienteering. And certainly I've had more comments this year about the sprint specification than anything else, I would say. Uh, certainly there were some interesting comments after the World Championships and the, the, the sprint relay in Italy just now. Um, so all I would say is if people do have any comments on that, then please send them to me, send them to the map, Mapping Commission. Uh, I'm really interested in, in those especially because that's one of my passions because I'm also a, a map maker in, um, as one of my jobs. And uh, I'm really interested to see what people think about the changes in the specification and also how they've been applied, because even even if I don't agree with the specification, I still think it's important that the competition maps follow the rules. So another question, so this was uh, raised after I think Idra when. Um, and also in the World Cup final, maybe uh, I don't know exactly the full details, but once all of the people with World Cup points had been put on the start list, then all the people with zero World Cup points basically started first, but in a random order rather than in a world ranking order. Maybe somebody can correct me on that, but I've had a couple of emails about that. Um, which also raises the question, is it fair to use the world ranking for start order? Um, I presented uh, at the high level event seminar ab uh, about a year and a, oh, maybe it was in the spring about how um, if you wanted to have a good world ranking, the only way to do it was to go to World Cups. And if you were not able to go to World Cups, then your chances of improving your world ranking to get a good start spot are very challenging. So that means if you're somebody coming from a smaller nation or not able to travel so much, you're always going to be at a disadvantage when it comes to start order. So this is something I'm aware of. Uh, I think if other people are interested in it or have an issue with it, then again, send me some information on it. Send me your thoughts. Uh, we can't change anything if people don't tell us there's a problem. World Cup format, we've already discussed that a little bit earlier on. Uh, what a big topic that was raised was about the live coverage of the orienteering, uh, the World Cup and the World Championships. Um, is the Live O platform good? I know there were various issues with following the tracking, the live GPS tracking of events this year. Again, please send us comments. We we don't know if there's a problem unless people tell us. Start intervals, we've already discussed a little bit. Um, Euron Anderson actually messaged to ask about the Olympic Games question and what we as athletes and coaches should be doing uh, to, to, towards that. Uh, don't worry, there's a whole other page of these as well. <laughs> so other things have been raised, the fact that the walk relay has twice in a row finished in the dark. It was also raised that uh, some international relays, the forkings have not been equal in time or distance, which has meant that uh, it's been unfair for certain teams. Um, it was also an issue potentially with the printing at World Championships, but maybe it was the, the actually the extreme weather conditions rather and the ter nature of the terrain rather than actually a printing issue. It was suggested that many other similar sports have an under 23 class. Which could be maybe not a thing to have at the World Championships or Jaywalk, but maybe it's uh, something to introduce into the World Cup. Uh, one athlete suggested that if people are breaking embargoes, then there should be a public list of these so that it's uh, possible to see that um, these rules are actually being enforced rather than just being told that somebody has, uh, has done this. I should point out, I'm not sure I agree with all of these suggestions or comments, but these are just what have been sent in. 
Yeah, athlete behavior during knockout sprint. This was interesting. Now it's a world championships distance. And this came after the training camp in Denmark last week, actually, when uh, there was certainly some aggressive behavior in the knockout sprint, which um, obviously it's down to split seconds and people trying to race for the finish line. Is there something that maybe the ethics committee needs to look out there? And um, um, by implication, does that also need to be thought about with the sprint relay as well? When people are racing head to head, then there's clearly going to be instances when people are going to come together. Uh, another point was the quality of the training maps for World Championships, whether they're relevant, whether they've got the, the right mapper, whether they're up to date. I've certainly experienced that over the years. There's been a huge variety in that. Um, I can't comment on any uh, the last couple of years because I've not been been there, but. Um, and then always an issue is if there's a problem at a World Championships or a, a, a high level event, how do we learn from that? And because the jury is always different and the event advisor is always different, how do they learn from what happened at previous events? What is the mechanism that they can see? Uh, okay, so we had this problem two years ago. What was the solution then? How did they resolve it? Rather than always deciding a new solution every time. So that's a lot of points. Would anybody like to say anything about any of those or anything else that they are interested in discussing just now? I see that there's a lot more chat about the mixed sprint relay. That's all very interesting. Um, Brett, you're talking about the few world ranking points. Would you like to say something about that? Yeah, I mean, it's just difficult for for obviously there's very few world ranking events in in uh, New Zealand, Australia. That's basically all we've got to to do. And if you've only got four weeks of holidays a year, and you've you're coming over to run World Champs or World Cup, you're always going to be a disadvantage if start lists are based on on the world ranking points. So so uh, that's that's pretty clear point from our part. We've previously had athletes have been over here for some time, but that goes a bit back and forth. Yeah, so I, I would say that it's even in Britain, it's the same thing. And the problem you have is that you're only racing against the people from Australia and New Zealand who usually don't have very high world ranking points. Yep. So so the points available at those point uh, at those races are quite low. So you're yep. never going to get the points that are going to improve your world ranking unless you go to the races in Sweden or Switzerland or the World Cups. And I've seen that again and again, that it's uh, like an, it's an um a self-reinforcing spiral to, to use a bit of a technical term so if, if you're doing the big races you get the good start spots you do well in the big races you keep your good start spot and it's really hard to break into that yep uh brigitte yeah just raising the question isn't it that we should uh change the system of the world ranking but not the system that Start order is uh, defined by either World Cup or World Ranking. I mean, what what would be the the better solution for the start list? I totally agree, and I don't know why it changed when it was five or six years ago, whenever it was when it changed. Uh, so basically, now the World Ranking and the World Cup are the same thing, as far as I can tell, which is never what wasn't the point. So you only get good World Ranking points if you go to a World Cup or World Championships, which is not what it's meant to be. Does anybody else have anything to say on on this? Does anybody know why the world ranking was changed a couple of years ago? So to give you a bit of background, uh, before it changed, it was entirely statistical based on how strong the field was. And so you would very often get very strong uh, fields, for example, at Portugal O meeting because loads of national team runners were going there and so you would get a strong average runner and a, then the winner would get high points. Nowadays, the there is a limit to how many points you can get at any race based on what level of the competition it is. So I believe at the World Championships, you can get 1500 points if you win and at a World Cup, you get 1450 if you win. Uh, and those are fixed, so the winner will always get that, and then everybody else is based on that. Uh, so the way to get good points is to run the international races, and everything else is pretty much a waste of time. 
if you're in the top 50. I just say further down, it's not quite the same. But if you're in the top 50 in the world, then it's it's basically international races or nothing. Ernst, question about unpassable fences in the terrain. Um, so the, the word unpassable or impassable means it is forbidden to cross. Does that answer your question? Yes. Forbidden to cross. Yes. OK, thanks. Is there a reason you're asking that or is it just something you want me to clarify something I was saying? I think there's a, a problem in the Austrian rules which are different from the international rules. That's the reason for my question. OK, thank you. Uh, Birgitta, what's your point? Uh, in Italy, we had the same questions for the forest races. In the forest, it's not forbidden. There it's only impossible. But if you yeah. find a way to pass it, it's allowed. OK, this so, is the problem. That, that That's exactly the problem we're talking about. OK, I have the, the ISOM rules in front of me in my hand, and it does say that um, in orienteering terrain, there may be features that are effectively impassable or uncrossable. Yeah, I well, I'm not going to read it all now, but um, that a feature is not mapped as impassable does not mean that it's not possible. Oh, it's, it's too complicated to look at it now, but OK, it's something to look at. <laughs> I, I know that it's an issue that it's it has changed in the latest specification as well as to whether it's the mapper's responsibility or the core setter's responsibility to define what is allowed to be crossed or not. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> so in the chat, Charlie has just posted uh, the the rule from the IOF rules about what is allowed to cross or not from ISOM and ISPROM mapping specifications. So I guess the main point is follow the rules, the IOF rules on this. OK, would anybody else like to make any comments about anything at all or ask any questions either from myself or any of the other people who are present? Birgitta. Sorry, me again. <laughs> That's all right. Um, as an SEA in the World Cup final, I again uh, faced the problem about the rule with the GPS watches. Um, okay. It's um, all the competitions, I think the international competitions coaches bring up the question, is it really forbidden? Can't we use it? Um, so like the rule, is set like it is nowadays so if you want to change it you have to act and uh, ask for a change of the rule and if the rule stays like this i would like strong strongly recommend you to buy logators or like small gps watches without display whatever for your athletes so they can have it on their arm they don't see a display and that's not the problem. It doesn't cost much, really. OK, maybe Charlie can tell us exactly what the rule says just now, or maybe you can, Brigitte. Oh, I don't have it. Charlie, maybe you have it open. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah I, the one with the display, it's forbidden. So I guess whatever the rule says, that is the rule not just for international competitions, but for all uh, IOF events. So it's not only an implication for for this, but also, for example, for world masters and for junior level. But of so, course, nobody is taking care about it there. No, of <laughs> not, course, not in the chain walk off, hopefully. But yeah. yeah, I think in world masters, it's uh, not so not enforced so strongly. OK, so what are your what's your suggestion here? Do you think that the rules should change or you think that um, are you telling the athletes and coaches how they should behave? Well, they have to behave according to the rule. So if you don't like the rule, what is pointed out every team official meeting, <laughs> um, then you have to see that it's going to 
if it has a chance to get changed. And if not, then I recommend to take the other solution. OK, thank you very much. Any more questions or comments? Oh, thank you, Charlie. You've posted it now. Competitors shall not use or carry tele telecommunication equipment between entering a pre-start area and reaching the finish unless approved by the organizer. OK, thank you. Would anybody else like to ask any questions or make any comments? Last chance. Ernst. I, I want to, uh, an authoritative uh, interpretation of the of the word shall not. Does it mean must not or should not? This shall, is yes. translated into other languages. This is ambiguous. OK, so that's a question for the Rules Commission. But in my personal opinion, which I'm not saying is the IOF opinion, shall not means must not. OK, thank you. Does anybody, any other uh, English speakers disagree with me? OK, uh, Eric. Yeah, I believe there's a clarification on that in the mapping um, documents. But I'd have to look that up. Where it actually says that shall means must not, or shall not means must not, at least for the for the East Pole. OK, thank you, Eric. Yeah. Are you on the mapping group, Eric? No, but I was just following this. That parts of these things were separated between the mapping and the and the rules. Uh, you know that some of these things were taken out of what was original in, in the mapping standards, and put into the rules. And and there's still some discussion on this. And I understand what Ernst is saying because this shall is ambiguous. Yeah. Yes. But that's so why there is. Yeah. That's why in the in the mapping standards there's actually a clarification on this. Yeah, so Leif's just posted in the chat about this as well. Hopefully that makes it nice and clear. OK. Uh, it seems like there are no more questions or comments, so I think we will stop there as it's uh, coming up to two hours. So that was very good. Thank you all very much again for joining. And I would just like to stress that please do just get in touch with us if you have any questions or comments or issues. Uh, that, that's how I would like us to function better in the future. And I hope this has been really useful for anybody, for everybody. Please do send me your feedback as well if this is something that we should do uh, every year or more often. Oh, thank you for some clapping. <laughs> OK, then uh, I will say good night. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope to see you all in the forest next year. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Gigi. That was excellent. Thank you, Helga. I'm really impressed by your way of uh, making sure that everyone is saying something and reading the chat and also asking someone to give additional comments. That's really an example to follow for everyone. So thank you once again. This has really been a great, great meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending. Okay. And I think there's plenty of things for us to discuss in our next meeting. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm unfortunately not available at the next meeting soon as I'm on a conference, but there will be plenty of other times, I'm sure, about that. So I'm um, looking forward to that indeed. Yes, good. And thank you, Yeni, for your help. Um, oh, I don't think that I did so much. I agree with Helga. <laughs> you managed good. But uh, Graham, I have put together, um, I have uh, saved all, uh, all the things in the chat and I have uh, also taken some notes. I will send them to you during tomorrow. 
That would be brilliant. Thank you. I'm discuss uh, if you need anything more about it. No, that's great. I made a few notes myself during it, but uh, they're just scribbles on a bit of paper. So uh, yeah. if you have have something better than that's that's fantastic. Yeah. I will send it to you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Right, I'm going to stop the recording now. I don't know what to do with the recording yet.